Blog Talk Radio. Welcome, world. Welcome once again to Tuesday Talk with Key West Lou. I am your host, Louis Patron. Another exciting week. Donald Trump in the limelight. Uh, he even outshines Joe Biden. I hope, I trust that after he is out of office, come January 20th, Uh, Over the next few months, he will become more subdued. Everything he says will not necessarily be front-page news. He won't have the bully puppet anymore. I'm sick of the guy. I'm glad he's going to be out of office. Uh, Forget that he's been the worst president we've ever had. He also happens to be a very mean man. Uh, And I just can't understand the things he does. We have all these people dying from coronavirus throughout this country. So many cases. We're in a huge surge. He doesn't talk about it at all. He's out there talking about how he gets screwed in this election. He won this state and that state. and He's president. He thinks he's president. And he's not. He's nothing. It's all in his head. Anyhow, we've got an interesting evening here. I'm diversifying the show a bit tonight. Some things we that don't involve Donald Trump. We're going to go to Tokyo, Washington, D.C., Germany, Vietnam, Texas, California, London, Russia, China, and Georgia, and a place called Miami Island. Not Miami Beach, not Miami, Miami Island. We're going to start off first with December 7th, 1941. That was yesterday. Everyone remembers it. Everyone knows about it who wasn't even alive at that time. It's in all the history books. December 7th, 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. The next day, the next day, President Roosevelt went before a joint session of Congress and asked for a declaration of war against Japan. The Constitution provides that only Congress can declare war. So Roosevelt had to go before them. Of course he got it. Only one congressperson uh, did not vote for it. He overwhelmingly got permission, or we did declare war on Japan. Uh, Today, Johnson, during Vietnam, says, you know, if i got to keep coming back to you people for authority uh, to have a fight here, I'm not going to get anything done. Because when the Vietnamese do this or somebody does that, we have to react immediately. We don't even have 24 hours. So it was Gulf Tongue or something resolution. I, I, I I don't remember the exact name. Anyhow, uh, they gave it to him. And all presidents since then assume that they can declare war, go to war, don't have to necessarily declare on any country. But that's the way it was back in 1947. It was better that way. We followed the Constitution to the letter. We wouldn't have been in 20 different countries in 20 different years fighting battles recently. Okay, so they, on December 8th, they gave President uh, Roosevelt authority to proceed with war against Japan. Now, it was just after the first of the year. We're into 1942 now, a month, two months maybe, into the year. And Roosevelt felt America had to retaliate against Japan. And the retaliation had to come soon. We couldn't wait around. We had to show them that we're not, we were not afraid of them, and we had the power, and we intended to defeat them. Uh, and he decided he wanted Tokyo bombed. Roosevelt decided we got to bomb Tokyo. He called a meeting of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to discuss it. And to a man, each member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff said, impossible to, uh, to bomb Tokyo for technical reasons. Uh, our carriers can't cl- carry bombers. We can't get that close. We don't have any islands nearby we can fly bombers uh, off of. Uh, It just won't work. It's never been done. It can't be done. And Roosevelt said very adamantly, sort of irritated, he was irritated, don't tell me it can't be done. Don't tell me it can't be done. Which which brings us now to the Jimmy Doolittle raid, uh, which took place on April 18, 1942. This thing's moving fast. December 7, 1941. Here it is, April 18th, 1942, and we are going to bomb Tokyo. And I'm not going to get into all the nitty-gritty details, but I want to share some things with you that you may not be aware of, some historical facts, 
Uh, I, I wasn't aware of two of the things I'm going to share with you tonight till yesterday. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. Okay, here's what happens. Uh, they put together 16 bombers, okay, 16 bombers, and they put them with crews on the USS Hornet, the carrier, the USS Hornet, which was going to take these carriers near Japan, and the bombers were going to fly off. They trained the men to do it and so forth. And they would go, these 16 bombers, they're not going to do a hell of a lot of damage, but they're going to go and show the Japanese who felt they were invincible. That was the word the Japanese used. We are invincible. Their people believed no one could ever attack their homeland, the islands, Tokyo especially, where the emperor lived. They were convinced of this. So they took off, and, well, here's the story. Um, Here's the story. That day, and this is one of, there's two things right now I'm going to share with you that they don't tell us in the history books, and I never heard about until I read about it yesterday. I came across something. Uh, That day, December 18th, when Doolittle's going to bomb Tokyo, the Japanese in March had planned to have a full-dress air raid drill, a full-dress air raid drill on that day over Tokyo. Now, there was a lot of, should we do it, we shouldn't do it in in Japanese quarters because we're invincible. What are we having an air raid drill for? We don't need it. We're never going to get bombed here. They can't get here with their planes. But they decided to have the full-dress air raid drill became a big deal. Okay, and this was decided late in March, uh, and it was scheduled for April 18th. Uh, now, it was to be three hours, the air raid drill. They're going to have airplanes up in the air, lots of them. And it would begin at 9 a.m., which means three hours, 9 a.m. It would complete. It would be finished at 12 noon. Well, Doolittle's got the 15 bombers following him. He, there are 16 bombers. He's flying one of them. And they didn't go the way they were supposed to go. They didn't get to Tokyo altogether. One was coming from the left. One was coming from the right. One was up in the air. One was down low. They were totally screwed up, and there were reasons for it. Uh, their instruments were faulty. They never made a run like this. It was early in the war, even against Germany. The weather was difficult, very harsh that day, and a lot of human error was involved by our people, our navigators especially. Uh, So all these things, though, these were mistakes. These were problems. Turned out to be a stroke of genius for us, a stroke of genius for these bombers, because when they finally did get to Tokyo or were getting to Tokyo and then got to Tokyo, no one knew who the hell they were. They thought they were part of the air raid drill. Okay? There was another thing going on that day. The emperor's birthday was soon to be. So there were a bunch of airplanes above the air raid drill planes practicing for the emperor's birthday. And they were practicing that morning between 9 and 12 also. Well, Doolittle and his people, because of their meanderings, the Japanese would see them, but get confused and mystified, weren't sure who they were and where they came from, and again assumed they were part of the air raid drill. Show you what, the things that happened that where they should have been discovered. Doolittle's plane crossed over a Japanese cruiser that took no notice of him. Okay, he reached. Time is important. The air raid drills from nine to noon. And Japanese people, very precise, starts at 9, ends at 12, they take off, they go away. He flew over thousands. He reached the coast first, let me tell you, of Japan at 11.55. At 11.55. Five minutes to go on the drill. He reaches the coast of Japan. Tokyo isn't on the coast. He had to go in, so he had more time. In the meantime, as he passes the coast, he flies over thousands of Japanese country folk, country people, that were on their way to wherever they were going, the rice paddies, I don't know. But they they waved to the planes. They were flying low, the American planes. They had the American emblem on them. But they waved, thinking they were Japanese planes, okay? Convinced they were on their way to Tokyo. 
Well, as Doolittle's approaching Tokyo, the three-hour drill was coming to an end. It became noon. Noon. Doolittle wasn't there yet, though. And the, they were taking down, the Japanese were taking down the, the flowing barge balloons. Uh, traffic began to flow normally on the streets again. People were walking. People continued to gawk up at the Japanese fighter plane umbrella that was leaving. Uh, it was over. The air raid drill was over. There were a few planes from the drill still left, and, but the Emperor's planes had also left. At 12.15, 15 minutes after the Japanese left from being over Tokyo with their fighter planes in the drill, at 12.15, the first American bombs exploded on Tokyo. Now, a Japanese anti-aircraft battery was nearby. They heard the bombing. They were confused. They thought it was part of the air raid drill, but they weren't sure. So they fired one round, one round, in the area where they heard the bombing, which would have been Doolittle because he was the first plane bombing. And then they broke off, and they, 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 went, they went back. They said, we're not going to – this was their theory. They were not going to blast and shoot down one of the Emperor's warplanes. That's precisely why they didn't stay the Santee. Uh, aircraft group. Well, the few Japanese fighters up in the air who still had not left the drill area to go back to their bases saw the United, the U.S. bombers below them. They saw all the bombers below them. They assumed they were part of the realistic air raid drill alert because they had been told by their superiors this drill is going to be realistic. So they assumed these were some kind of Japanese bombers that had been painted with the American insignia, and they were part of the drill. So they just left and went back to their base, giving no concern to Doolittle and his other bombers. All right? Uh, cool, isn't it? And because of that, Doolittle's people were able to drop their bombs in the invincible city of Tokyo, uh, the country of Japan was bombed for the first time ever. Uh, their emperor was placed in danger. They were humiliated. The Japanese military was humiliated because the American bombers had gotten through. No serious damage was done uh, to Tokyo. Most of the American bombers even missed where they were supposed to drop the bombs. It was a total screw-up on the American side. Not their fault. First time ever in a situation like this. Um, and they just didn't know what the hell they were doing, and their instruments weren't right, and the, our, our navigators weren't experienced. Yet. It's just one of these things that happened, but it worked out for the good in the final analysis. want to talk now about Michael Flynn, retired general. Remember him? Uh, he was pardoned about two weeks ago by President Trump. He had lied twice to a federal judge. He, he, he pled guilty twice to the same crime. This is about two or three years ago. and uh, But he's been jerking the federal judge around. He's got a new lawyer, wants to withdraw his plea. Uh, he got screwed up by the court, screwed up by uh, the federal prosecutors, the Department of Justice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in any event, he's Trump's friend. And Trump pardoned him. Like he's going to pardon, they say, about 20 people between now and the time he leaves office. Uh, I, I, you know, I have this thought in the back of my mind. It's really humorous, I think, but I wouldn't put it past it. It would be because Trump says it's going to surprise everybody with the pardon. It's going to be a lot of them. If he took one jail and just pardoned everyone that's in that federal jail, he would do something like that. Anyhow, let's get back to Michael Flynn. About 10 days ago, Michael Flynn, who was, even a week ago it was, who is beholden to Donald Trump for pardoning him, who is beholden to the United States Constitution, which provides and gives the power to a president to pardon, was interviewed by Esquire by a Jack Holmes on December 2nd. And he said, Flynn, he endorsed a call for the president, 
and I quote, to temporarily suspend the Constitution. Flint's saying he wants Trump to temporarily suspend the, suspend the Constitution. Declare limited martial law. Martial law. Have the military, the U.S. military, the Army, have the military oversee a national revolt. R-E-O-V-T-E, not revolt, but revolt. But in effect, it would have been a revolt. And silence the destructive media. Wanted those things done. This is what he said. It ended up in writing. Uh, Isn't that wild? Now, what does that sound like? Suspend the Constitution, declare martial law, uh, call out the army, have a national revolt. Silence the people against you, the destructive media. A coup d'etat, it's the calling of a revolution, the calling for a revolution. By any other name, it could be nothing but a coup. And that's what this man, Michael Flynn, uh, who owes his ass to our Constitution, forget Trump. He wouldn't have the power without the Constitution. And yet, I don't know how a four-star general retired could have that much distaste for the country that made him. I don't understand it. Now I want to talk about someone that many of you may not have heard of, a great American hero. You've got to, I, I found as I get older, I'm 85, I say that a lot. I'm 85. I know a lot of things. But when I talk to somebody 55, 65, they don't know what the hell I'm talking about because they didn't live during the time frame that I did. Okay, so it would not be uncommon for a lot of people to not know who Chuck Yeager was. Here's the story. He died, by the way, yesterday at the age of 97. He died yesterday at the age of 97. Some consider him the greatest pilot in the history of the United States. Those that don't consider him one of the greatest pilots in the history of the United States. Let me share with you his background. You make your own judgment. He was an Air Force test pilot. He was the first person to break the sound barrier. First person to break the sound barrier. Did this in October 1987. Six years later, he was one of the first people to fly at twice the speed of sound. He was an Air Force test pilot. Those were dangerous trips he was taking. Break the sound barrier, fly at twice the speed of sound. They were first times, okay? Uh, Then they were selecting people to be in that first bunch of astronauts. He was very disappointed that he was not selected. He thought that his experience, and there's more to share that had gone on before this time, qualified him. But for some reason, he wasn't selected. Nevertheless, he worked for the program and was was one of the greatest assets in training the astronauts. Now, let me give you a little more background of this. During World War II, he flew a fighter plane, a P-51, over Germany and France. He was a double ace. He shot down 12 German planes. Vietnam. He flew 127 combat missions, not in a fighter plane. This time, he flew a B-57 bomber, 127 combat missions. He retired from the Air Force in 1975 at the rank of Brigadier General. Now, if this guy is not a distinguished airman, and Probably, perhaps the greatest pilot in the history of our country. But if he is, and he's probably in the top two or three. A great man died yesterday, and everyone should be aware of who who Chuck Yeager is and was. Want to talk today about a statement Trump made yesterday. Uh, Trump makes a lot of nice statements. He said, I don't understand sometimes where these things come from. He was disturbed, okay, because the 2020 election, the presidential election that just left us, okay, compare, he compared our election to that of a third-party country. We were a third-party country. And it's got to be because he lost and everything else. But this man has a, 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 an ability 
to use something that isn't correct to make him look good. We're a third world country, and that is in effect why he did not outright win the election. I want to talk about Ivanka and Jared now. Okay, Ivanka and Gerald, Jared Kushner. Uh, appreciate that when Trump became president, Jared had financial problems. In fact, he never got officially top security uh, passage or reference because he owed so much money. And if you recall, during the first two years that Trump was in office and he was part of, he was a top advisor to Trump, he was flying to Saudi Arabia, to China, everywhere, looking to borrow money to get his ass out of debt. There was a building in New York City that was killing him. He had overpaid to get it. It was either 666. I'm not sure what the building was. It was massive. And he was going to lose it because he had to come up with a big payment in the second year uh, that Trump was in office or he would lose the building. He must have come up with it, but he was a broker, just like Donald Trump was and is a broker, as we are finding out. Anyhow, they're going to be retired now. Daddy, daddy-in-law is retired as of January 20th. Uh, note, my friends, that Trump and Ivanka and uh, his wife wanted to go back to New York City to live because Trump had never been accepted in the so- with the social elite, the high social class in New York, the very high business people, the very the most influential banker, bankers, because he's a horse's ass, and he's just got a mouth that you can't stand. He didn't change when he became president. We discovered that is who he was. And he learned that if he went back, certain people still didn't want to know him. Okay. So now he is going to retire to Mar-a-Lago. He did not spend Christmas at Mar-a-Lago because they are, refurb- they are redoing his quarters in Mar-a-Lago, which will be ready by January 20th. Now, Ivanka and Jared thought they they were accepted. Young people are accepted by young influential people before Trump went to the White House. And they thought they would go back to New York, and the friends they had then, they would have today. And they would be part of that social elite. They went back to visit found out their friends of yesterday were not as close to them as today and, frankly, did not want to be their close friends. So now they knew they weren't going to go back to New York. Why go back to New York? We're not going to have any fun. We're not wanted. So here's what I'm telling you this story, and I'm leading up to Ivanka and Jared and what happened in the last few days. It was announced yesterday that Ivanka and Jared purchased a plot of land on Miami Island, not Miami Beach, not Miami. It's between the two on Indian Creek. I, I've been there for a couple of parties over the years. These are homes, home homes, massive, like you wouldn't believe. What properties? That's all I can tell you, what properties. Anyhow, they pay, this is only a one-point-acre lot they're going to build a home on. One-point-acre lot. They paid $31 million. You heard me, $31 million. Now, <laughs> that's a lot of money. <laughs> Julio and Glacy used to own it. That's a lot of money for an empty lot, even if it had a house on it, $31 million. So obviously they're going right in the middle, and will be. they will be accepted in Miami because it's a different class of people. Not that they are any less elites, the people who run Miami, but they're a different breed of people. I, I would say they're the nouveau riche. They've been the nouveau riche uh, since after World War II, and so they have a different attitude towards things. But a 31, obviously, the building, he must have saved the building's ass in New York City, and his financial condition must be better. Or we're going to find out he had his hand in the pot somewhere and is going to get tr- in trouble after his father-in-law retires. Rudy Giuliani comes down with coronavirus. This is, what, five days, four or five days since he went to the Georgetown University Hospital with COVID-19. I'm going to say something strange. I I, I wish bad luck on no one, except Donald Trump. I do. I can't help it. But even Giuliani, I don't wish him bad luck. He's a horse's ass. 
he was used. He was a fantastic lawyer once. He was one of the greats. But at 75, he's beyond his time. Professionals know when their time has passed them. I knew when my time passed me. I was 71. I said, you've had it, Lewis, because you're not as swift. You know, you're just not as swift. You don't have it like you had yesterday. And Giuliani's not aware of that, okay? And why did he get coronavirus? Because he's running his ass all over the world, not just the United States. He refuses to wear a mask, and he doesn't social distance. I really hope for his sake and the people around him that when he he is discharged, I hope he gets discharged from the hospital. If this was a minor thing, he should have been out by now five days, uh, that he does social mask and he does social distance, does wear the mask, uh, for his own benefit and that of the people around him. Texas, these lawsuits. Uh, there was a lawsuit decided uh, today by the United States Supreme Court, which should have been the last lawsuit out there, been about 45 or 48. Trump has lost all of them but one. And the Supreme Court of the United States refused to hear this case today. Okay, where? Today is called Safe Harbor Day. Today, every state sends to the federal government. They certify, they've already certified, and they send their certification of the votes in their state to the federal government. And after this date, no one can challenge that vote. No one could challenge, for example, Biden's election now. It's called safe harbor. Well, Texas, (laughs) the state of Texas decided they don't care about the safe harbor thing. Texas this morning, on the day that safe harbor takes place, sued four states, Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. These were the battle states, the battleground states, Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. The grounds were that the pandemic came into being, and this changed election procedures, and it was unconstitutional for election procedures to be changed without the federal government. Well, let me tell you something. The federal government has nothing to do with election procedures. That is the business of the state. They don't even know these things when they bring these lawsuits, okay? It's a long shot. It's a long shot lawsuit, and it doesn't make any difference, though, because it was sued today. It's going to go on after today, and the votes in those four states cannot be challenged. California, Governor Newsom. He's got a tough job out there. California's getting killed. The whole country's getting killed. We are in a gigantic surge. Additional new cases, more deaths. It's amazing. And Trump pays no attention to this, by the way, since the election. Anyhow, it's very bad in California. And Governor Newsom did what he thought he had to do. He's got, in effect, a total shutdown till Christmas Eve. Started last night at 11.59. Or, and it goes to December 21st, I'm sorry. And, uh, you know, you got to stay in the house. you got to wear your mask if you're outside. you got to social distance. Many businesses are being closed automatically. And gatherings of more than 10 people in your home are banned, as well as outside a person's home. Well, the people are upset. And you know what? The sheriff's department uh, in in the San Francisco area, the sheriff said, I'm not going to enforce it. I'm not going to go out and arrest people who are my friends for something he thinks is bullshit. This won't be of any help. And other police departments have now done the same thing. How can the leader of a state enforce a law to bring good health back to his people if those, impo- those who must carry out that, that law won't do it. I don't understand this, how they can say, I won't do it. Anyhow, that's the show for this week. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, I enjoy doing it. I enjoy doing it every week. Again, I ask you to read my blog that comes out. It gets published every day around noon. It's like this show. And as I say every, every week when I do the show, if you like the show, read my blog. If you don't like the show, don't read the blog. Thank you again for joining me. I look forward to being with you next week. <laughs>